Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Luke 9, verses 18 to 22, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Luke. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Luke, chapter 9, verses 18 to 22. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah, and others, that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. This is the word of the Lord. Let us notice in this passage the variety of opinions about our Lord Jesus Christ, which prevailed during his earthly ministry. We are told that some said that he was John the Baptist, some that he was Elijah, and some that one of the old prophets was risen again. One common remark applies to all these opinions. All were agreed that our Lord's doctrine was not like that of the scribes and Pharisees. All saw in him a bold witness against the evil that was in the world. Let it never surprise us to find the same variety of opinions about Christ and his gospel in our own times. God's truth disturbs the spiritual laziness of men. It obliges them to think. It makes them begin to talk and reason and speculate and invent theories to account for its spread in some quarters and its rejection in others. Thousands in every age of the church spend their lives in this way and never come to the point of drawing near to God. They satisfy themselves with a miserable round of gossip about this preacher's sermons and that writer's opinions. They think this man goes too far, and that man does not go far enough. Some doctrines they approve, and others they disapprove. Some teachers they call sound, and others they call unsound. They cannot quite make up their own minds what is true or what is right. Year rolls on after year and finds them in the same state, talking, criticizing, fault-finding, speculating, but never getting any further hovering like a moth round religion, but never settling down like the bee to feed on its treasures. They never boldly lay hold of Christ. They never set themselves heartily to the great business of serving God. They never take up the cross and become thorough Christians. And at last, after all their talking, they die in their sins, unprepared to meet God. Let us not be content with a religion of this kind. It will not save us to talk and speculate and exchange opinions about the gospel. The Christianity that saves is a thing personally grasped, personally experienced, personally felt, and personally possessed. There is not the slightest excuse for stopping short in talk, opinion, and speculation. The Jews of our Lord's time might have found out, if they had been honest inquirers, that Jesus of Nazareth was neither John the Baptist, nor Elijah, nor an old prophet, but the Christ of God. The speculative Christian of our own day might easily satisfy himself on every point which is needful of salvation if he would really, candidly, and humbly seek the teaching of the Spirit. The words of our Lord are weighty and solemn. If any man will do God's will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God. John 7.17 Honest, practical obedience is one of the keys to the gate of knowledge. Let us notice, secondly, in this passage, the singular knowledge and faith displayed by the Apostle Peter. We read that when our Lord said to his disciples, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. This was a noble confession, and one of which, in these days, we can hardly realize the full value. To estimate it aright, we should place ourselves in the position of our Lord's disciples. We should call to mind that the great and wise and learned of their own nation saw no beauty in their master and would not receive him as the Messiah. We should recollect that they saw no royal dignity about our Lord, no crown, no army, no earthly dominion. They saw nothing but a poor man who often had no place in which to lay his head. And yet it was this time and under these circumstances 
that Peter boldly declares his faith that Jesus is the Christ of God. Truly, this was great faith. It was mingled, no doubt, with much ignorance and imperfection, but such as it was, it was a faith that stood alone. He that had it was a remarkable man, and far in advance of the age in which they lived. We should pray fervently that God would raise up more Christians of the stamp of the Apostle Peter. Erring and unstable and ignorant of his own heart as he sometimes proved, that blessed Apostle was in some respects one in ten thousand. He had faith and zeal and love to Christ's cause when almost all Israel was unbelieving and cold. We need more men of this sort. We need men who were not afraid to stand alone and to cleave to Christ when the many are against him. Such men, like Peter, may err sadly at times, but in the long run of life will do more good than any. Knowledge, no doubt, is an excellent thing, but knowledge without zeal and warmth will never do much for the world. Let us notice, thirdly, in this passage, our Lord's prediction of his own coming death. We read that he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. These words, as we read them now, sound simple and plain, but there lie beneath the surface of them two truths which ought to be carefully remembered. For one thing, our Lord's prediction shows us that his death upon the cross was a voluntary act of his own free will. He was not delivered up to Pilate and crucified because he could not help it and had no power to crush his enemies. His death was the result of the eternal counsels of the blessed Trinity. He had undertaken to suffer for man's sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He had engaged to bear our sins as our substitute and surety, and he bore them willingly in his own person on the tree. He saw Calvary and the cross before him all the days of his ministry. He went up to them willingly, knowingly, and with full consent that he might pay our debts in his own blood. His death was not the death of a mere weak son of man who could not escape, but the death of one who was very God of very God, and undertaken to be punished in our stead. For another thing, our Lord's prediction shows us the blinding effect of prejudice on men's hearts and minds. Clear and plain as his words now seem to us, his disciples did not understand them. They heard as though they heard not. They could not understand that Messiah was to be cut off. They could not receive the doctrine that their own master must die. And hence, when his death really took place, they were amazed and confounded. Often, as he told them of it, they had never realized it as a fact. Let us watch and pray against prejudice. Many zealous men have grievously been misled by it and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let us beware of allowing traditions old preconceived notions, unsound interpretations, baseless theories in religion to find root in our hearts. There is but one test of truth. What says the scripture? Before this, let every prejudice go down. That is the end of Rao's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we've heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we've just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, the goal of knowing God is loving Him more deeply. Does our study and meditation of Scripture and sermons have this effect, or are we content to speculate without, as Ryle says, settling down like a bee to feed on its treasures? Second, Ryle says that although knowledge is excellent, it will never do much for the world without zeal and warmth. To what degree would we say our zeal and warmth meet our knowledge? And thirdly, the gospel can become negatively familiar to us, but what does hearing of the willingness of Christ going to the cross and his being very God of very God do to our hearts as we hear this good news again even now?